Hello, uh, this is Balkan Devlan uh, from University of Copenhagen, uh, and we are continuing with our interview series for the uh, course uh, Thinking the Unthinkable from Black Swans to Essential Risk. Today, I am uh, pleased to join by uh, Dr. Rodas, um, Executive Director for the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the Cambridge uh, University. Uh, her work uh, has broadly focused on interactions between and the respective roles of science and governance in addressing major global challenges. Uh, in the context of the extreme uh, technological risks, Catherine is particularly interested in understanding the intersection and the combination of risks uh, stemming from technologies and risks stemming from governance, so it's, the, it's how, how they relate to, to each other. She has particular expertise in the international governance of biotechnology, including biosecurity and broader risk management issues, um, she has a background in international relations, but also engaged in extensive interdisciplinary work. Um, her project, her PhD project, was a part of the project to strengthen biological weapon convention at the Bradford Disarmament Research Center. And she retains a strong interest in international actions to prevent the misuse of bioscience. A lot of uh, a lot of is you know, very relevant to what we are um, going to discuss today, and what we're going through today. Um, her recent uh, contributions. Uh, to this project includes uh, the, the projects on the development of biosecurity and ethics education on improving uh, science and technology, uh, reviewing the biological and chemical uh, weapons control regimes. Uh, Catherine also worked uh, for the Institute of, uh, for Science, Ethics and Innovation at Manchester uh, University. And uh, in that work, she, she, she worked on elaborating the meaning in the context of scientific responsibility at the global level, uh, investigation uh, of science, uh, advisory processes uh, in organi international organizations, and a substantial study of the international governance of genetic resources, uh, which has significant implications for the use of biosciences in uh, managing uh, major uh, global uh, global challenges. Um, she coordinates the work uh, for the Managing Extreme Technological Risk Project, which is supported by the Templeton our World Charity uh, Foundation. Uh, as you can see, her work really uh, covers a lot uh, of the intersection that in the, in, in the program, uh, we also try to reach out to that is the governance and international governance of these interesting risks. Uh, Catherine, thanks for uh, coming on, on to this today. Thank you. So uh, let me start by asking you, uh, I did a talk a bit about your background, but could, could you give us a little bit more on, on, on your background and how you end up getting into this existential risk business. Sure. Um, so as you said in the introduction, I started out um, studying international relations and then did a PhD that looked at um, regulation of biotechnology. And uh, while it looked at biotechnology regulation quite broadly, that was for the purpose of working out whether other international rules were supporting the operation of the Biological Weapons Convention, or maybe they were in conflict or tension with it. So looking at health rules, environment rules, trade rules, and seeing how they all worked together, or not, as the case is. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was really looking about the fact that uh, international regulations that are dealing with biotechnology are quite fragmented um, and don't act in a coherent manner. And so it was concerned with what are the implications of that. Um, I then sort of diverted away from looking more at the um, risk end of things. Um, I got particularly interested in things to do with um, inequalities and access and benefit sharing, um, global justice, which have come back into my work more recently. Uh, so that's what I was doing at Manchester University. I was really looking further at the governance of genetic resources, uh, about how those are managed under state sovereign rights, the implications that has. Um, and so it wasn't until I finished my work there, I was looking for another job that I came across the uh, Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, my role there is actually mainly to do with um, managing the centre, <laughs> largely, um, with a smaller component for research. But the research areas of interest that have kind of pulled through are both the looking at misuse of biotechnologies and biology, um, and also the benefits that, that, that are there, um, so benefits and risks in that area, but also an understanding of international governance and being able to apply that more widely to existential risks, um, which hadn't, hadn't been done in, in a kind of broad way um, before. So that was a few years ago that I joined. 
Uh, I mean, I think that's that's an excellent point, and that's one sort of um, one thing that strikes me when I was I was I was looking at these things and started being interested in several years ago is that the the the, the sort of the IR or international governance component seems to be a lot less uh, involved. Partly, I guess, because of the, the 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 number of people who have this background getting into it. When you look at it, there's a lot of you know uh, mathematicians, scientists, physicists. Uh, uh, some ethicists uh, coming through and, and, and whatnot, but the, uh, the people with political science or international relations backgrounds seem to be sort of not many. So I'm actually glad that uh, someone with that background is, is taking a lot of interest, particularly with the governance issues. I mean, there's a lot of work, as you said, uh, has been done on this field. And I think there's a lot uh, that cross fertilization between global governance uh, studies as well as uh, intersectionalists that can be done. Um, and you mentioned about the sort of the uh, the, the ethics uh, component. That also seems to be one of the threads across people who are working on this. They're very much concerned about the greater good in that sense. Uh, very much concerned about uh, coming from different, perhaps, um, uh, you know, ethical perspectives. Not you know, not everybody's sort of effective altruism uh, line, uh, but you know there is that concern about both the existing inequalities and the future effects of these things on, 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 on a global scale. I think that's, that's, that's very important. Could you elaborate perhaps a little bit on that? I think that's, that's when we talk, we tend to sort of somehow either assume the effective altruism argument and then sort of put the other things aside and focus on the technical uh, for a while uh, when we discuss these things. But I think that, that ethical component is, is extremely important, especially on, on global catastrophic risk components, not you know, necessarily complete, you know, uh, wiping out of humanity, but you know these these catastrophes where the the effects will be very unequal. All right, so um, could you sort of maybe you know elaborate on that inequality dimension of it? Sure, and I think um, I'll start with sort of pointing where my I guess ethical motivations lie mm -hmm. in in studying this area. I think for me it's less less concern about the very long term future of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I find I'm more directly motivated by thinking of the suffering that would play out as, as a sort of risk, catastrophic risk unfolds and um, avoiding that. So I think that links to inequality in a few ways. In, like you say, people will be affected differently and they are affected differently globally by any type of event towards the, you know, going towards that scale of existential risk. But also that inequalities, and when it comes to governance, inequalities are something that can undermine our, um, both our abilities to coordinate, but also the incentives that other countries have to cooperate. So, um, yeah, we, we have started to, to look at, at um, the specific strand of global justice and the governance of global catastrophic risks, because we think that's going to be really important, both in, in a sort of input to, to how well we can govern and the output of inequalities. You know, that's 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 fascinating, and I think we are already seeing it in the sense that in in a small scale mock up of, of what a global catastrophic risk could look like in this in this, in this COVID nineteen pandemic, and how these inequalities, both access to healthcare, but also the resources, the the equipment, you know, the institutional competence, um, and all that, you know, have have very immediate effects on, on people's lives. So that's that's actually very very clear. Um, Another question I want to ask, you know, is is when you when you look at the field now that so you're also managing this one of one of, one of the major centers uh, on this, um, which which risks seem to be sort of more concerning to you? Which 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 uh, I mean, we are, they're all all, all all possible concerns, but which maybe subset of uh, uh, risk, which classes of risks that that you seem to be more concerned about uh, in existential risks. So I think some of this is maybe the, the risks that we don't, don't necessarily spot as easily. And that's not, not, I'm not talking about the unknowns. I'm talking about things we know about, but are kind of there in the background and we're not paying sufficient attention to. Perhaps. Mm. So I think climate change is one of those examples. That's an ongoing kind of problem that's sitting in the background. And because it's this kind of ongoing gradual thing, I think it's, it's easy for us to be diverted in our attention to more sudden shocking um, risks. Um, it's not to say that they're not also important, but I think that's what we can tend to neglect. And then I think it is that thing about 
uh, not just concentrating on individual risks, but things that cut across them. So again, inequality, justice is one of those, but also trying to think of risk as a systemic thing um, uh, that we can't easily separate out the complexity of. Is, yeah, so I think that's an increasingly important part of our focus as well, mine included, is understanding that this is not just a kind of single event equals catastrophe, it's lots of things interacting and of course this makes governance much more complex as well yeah. you're not just targeting one thing you're having to manage a mess of yes. <laughs> things i think one thing that came up in the previous interviews is this idea of the uh, of the this you know the, the risk matrix that you know how they sort of uh, provide both background uh, as amplification as as the steps to other other risks or making certain things certain risks you know, tip from from a you know massive risk to or, or or a disaster to global catastrophic risk and how they relate to each other and and I think it was in the in the talk with Phil Torres that that we were uh, that I was having he was saying that you know in the initial time when you know, Nick Bostrom was writing it back in two thousand two uh, it would it wouldn't make sense to uh, to focus on individual risks because we need to first you know map the field and see what it is but I think we are sufficiently ahead in the field right now to be able to think more you know, interactively and and bring it and of course as he was he was also pointing out that is also a bit depressing because it also means that the challenges are are are, are a lot more in in dealing with that and, and let me you know with, with, with the challenges let me sort of pivot to to the idea of how to get a grip of this right uh, fundamentally the issue is it would always come down to how can we study this? What is what are the the the, the methods to do this? And, and and in many cases, in some cases, we have some some form of base rates. Things happened before you know in the geological time that we can figure out. But in other cases, we have no example of it by definition. You know, so we are around. So human civilization has never been wiped out uh, in its totality. Um, how to how to get a handle on that? You know, what what methodologies, ways of thinking. And not necessarily specifically only related with science, but so more broadly, what ways of thinking uh, are, are are useful, uh, in your opinion, in, in getting a getting a grip on on on, on existential risks? So I think one of the really important things is is being interdisciplinary because it's not just one field that needs to deal with it, um, and so it's trying to both acknowledge that you you bring a lot of value from your own discipline, um, international relations. That has a lot of value in this area but also that there are limitations to each discipline in what they can see and what tools they use things that you can then have learning by combining this with other approaches so i think that's that's a good starting point um i think as well that some of the sort of important of that is that those we're not necessarily taught those skills as we get through our careers so it's not only i mean this is often said of scientists so they don't you know they don't learn any of the humanities stuff they don't know how to do this uh, but it's also true that if you're in humanities you probably don't learn actually that much about really crossing between disciplines that aren't you know just next door um, mm. and they have to communicate so i think that's really important and so for example one of the things that's been important in communicating with technology communities is not just setting this out as yeah, we're, it's it's all about risks and you know you should really think about what you're doing kind of telling off <laughs> um, it's about acknowledging there are great benefits as well and in fact we wouldn't be struggling to work out how to govern these things if it was only a risk <laughs> so um, i think that's kind of um, an important thing that's a kind of characteristic i guess in terms of i think a lot of the people who work in the center they're in these different disciplines they have a characteristic of curiosity Mm -hmm. that, that helps them engage with other disciplines he, that that level of being reflective and having some humility about their own discipline um, and that willingness to engage with other communities as well and that's i think that's very important and i think the, the the whole intellectual humility component is i think is fundamental in the sense that a lot of when, when i talk with people what really sort of amazed me is is a lot of them are uh you know get into this and worrying about these risks because they feel they don't know. You know, we don't know enough. We do, and they have ethical commitments. And that intellectual, you know, humility uh, about the limits our knowledge is what actually sort of pushes them 
to study and learn more and, and engage and reach across the aisle in that sense um, to learn from other disciplines and, and bring it rather than, you know, assuming, oh, we know everything and it's going to be fine and we sort it out. I have these three theories that explains everything in the world and we, we move on from there um, sort of thing. So, no, I think that is a very, very important personality characteristic that, that, that seems to be driving this. Um, in the center, what, what, what are your priorities right now in the sense of moving forward um, uh, with, with these variety of risks uh, that, that, that you're dealing with? So a lot of this is interesting. We, we're kind of just entering a, a new phase as, as one uh, big set of funding comes to an end and a, a new one sets up. Um, one of that is is what you've been talking about really is leading into what are the sort of methods that we should be using to, to study these things. Um, both how can we develop those methods ourselves and then how can we share them? Um, because again, even in a large-ish centre, there's only there's about 20, 22 of us at the moment, um, you can't have everything there that you need. You can't make all those connections individually. And so having methods that others can share is important. Alongside that, it's reflecting on, we can build knowledge and understanding, that's, that's great. But we also, we all believe it's important that this is a kind of applied thing that, that has an effect in the real world. And therefore, what's, what, what is it that we need to do to go from one to the other? So we, we're calling it from, from attention to action. So how do you move from, yeah, people have, Oh yeah, yeah. There are these these risks. It's important sort of thing to okay. And now, as a policymaker, as someone working in technology, I'm going to do something about this. Or just a member of the general public. Go, yeah, I I want to be aware of this and know about it. No, I think that's that's one of the wicked problems in the field. I guess in the sense of okay, how first how do we get the attention of the of the policymakers, but also how to make them uh, devote resources to this and how to compete with other priorities and misaligned incentives and how to get in there. And I think, um, you know, my, my, my humble opinion uh, is, is that it, it is very important to sort of, going back to Aristotle with the whole idea of promises and the practical wisdom. And, and it, it really is important to be able to either have people working on these who also have a policy experience, especially in, 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 in either very big companies uh, technology companies or and or in the governments that are actually also interested in that and then we can bring that in um, uh, because we tend to be you know, mostly sort of people academics working on this but that that link is missing and without using that lever we will not be able to um, have the you know, action that is compatible with our ethical commitments that because we want to make the world better uh, either now or in the very long term but you know that, that requires action. I think that is an, a, a very, very important way of thinking and have to, we have to think more thoroughly. And you know, this pandemic perhaps you know, attune people more um, to this kind of messaging. Um, and which, which leads me to, to the question, which everybody keeps asking, of course, um, is COVID-19 and what, uh, what, what, what the study of existential risks um, can tell us, both in terms of understanding this particular threat particularly what we are going through right now, but also what, what we need to do um, uh, with regards to the current pandemic. So again, I mean, it will come from, I think, our own backgrounds and what we can bring to understanding of this. And I think it's also what we can take and learn from it. I think that that's, seems to have been the real kind of point of engagement with a lot of people in the centre is that we won't, we don't, fortunately see these things play out too often so what is it we can learn from this that would would you know we can again share for for another form of um, risk or disaster or for a repeat of this one what is it we're learning there um a lot of that again how is how are things communicated that seems to be a kind of big issue between different countries as well that there are different approaches to how you communicate with with your public um get them on board how do you communicate between government and scientists, this sort of thing. So I think that's that's really important. I think it's interesting to see how uncertainty is handled because there is still a lot of uncertainty, including scientific uncertainty about this. There's a lot of unknowns about what the effects of different policies are going to be. Um, I, I mean, yes, some governments are getting some things wrong, clearly, but it's also, I think, <laughs> In, in that sense of having some humility in this, it's actually very difficult if you're suddenly facing with something like this as a government um, with great uncertainty, not really being sure what, 
what will work and what won't. So, um, you, you know, you've got to accept that there, there are going to be challenges doing that. So I think, I think that is interesting. Um, think, so personally, I had done some previous work looking at pandemic preparedness. Um, and I mean, it's clearly been demonstrated that a lot of the work on pandemic preparedness was correct in that we, a lot of that work was just saying we aren't prepared enough. <laughs> um, a lot of that has been things like we should have built up these capacities in the healthcare systems already. Um, but again, you can see why those things don't happen in, in terms of your understanding of government and policy. Um, so again, you can understand that a government doesn't want to be spending money on something that just looks like spare capacity. Why well, have that there for 10, 20, 30 years, not get used? How do you make those kind of, how can they, how do they know about the economic case for that really, I think is, is important. Again, maybe that will improve after this event. Um, I, I hope those lessons aren't kind of only short term. And, and I do think, again, if we take this internationally, what we're actually still kind of waiting to see is how some of the things play out when we come to, for example, if a vaccine gets developed, mm -hmm. um, how does that get distributed? Is it done on a fair basis? Or is it, as we have had with past um, pandemics, not at this scale of pandemic, but for example, the, the swine flu outbreak mm -hmm. in 2009, where it was clear that seven industrialised states, they, they got the vaccine uh, capacity. And that caused a lot of upset amongst the international community, but that was a very mild pandemic. It, it really didn't. If we saw the same pattern with this, then, then that would pose a serious threat to international cooperation. So, yeah, I'm kind of waiting and hoping <laughs> that, that we uh, take a more mature response to that. So in that sense, I mean, this pandemic, you know, not only is it the existential risk, uh, work can tell us something about the pandemic, but the pandemic can, else, can tell us something about the existential risk and how we respond to it too, in that sense. It's a, I don't want to use this word, but it's a, it's a dry run, perhaps, to, uh, to, 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 to break you know, broader or, or greater uh, catastrophic risk and, and, and can give, give us some clues about our capacity to deal with these things, uh, which levers seem to be working, which doesn't, where are our blind spots? In, in, in recognizing the, these, these stuff. I mean, one of the fundamental things that sort of not very surprising when you work on IR and the, you know, sort of the great power competition issue, but you know, that came out even here is the whole sort of uh, you know, bickering, let me put it that way, um, uh, between different great powers, uh, plus the whole disinformation uh, aspect of it, which is to me, in, in, in a way, amazing. You know, we're going through a pandemic, and you take this as an opportunity to push for uh, for a particular political agenda. Awesome. Um, so you know that also tells us the uh, what are the blind spots really in terms of, of in the in the research. I, I perhaps there is research, but I don't remember, for instance, going back and looking at it. Um, research on you know, how would people spread this information about a particular catastrophic risk and how that might sort of hamper. Um, the way that we respond to it, and perhaps going forward, we might need to worry about on that on that a little bit more. Sure, and I, I think as well, it teaches us um, things about systemic nature of risks too. So I think again, one of the things I've noticed is, uh, well, we need to start quite quickly thinking about how this relates to food systems, both in the terms of it's possible that this emerged from practices in food systems, but also how it then impacts food systems. So of course there will be calls to kind of close wet markets and this sort of thing, and, but like how much of the world's population relies on kind of informal markets to, to get hold of their food. Um, and so, yeah, it's, again, there's that complexity there, but it's, it's just interesting to see these points get picked up and, and okay, so, so, and it's generally the case that different, again, different disciplines and things, they're noticing these things. So it is getting picked up and people are studying it. So it's, yeah, it's interesting from that point. And again, the, the, it brings in the whole idea of the interdisciplinarity, the importance of, of this being able to look at from, from multiple, multiple perspectives. My concern is, is that in, 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 in IR, we, you know, you, you will well know, we do fight the last war all the time, right? Um, and 9-11 happens, everybody focuses on terrorism. And then, X happens and everybody focuses on that. And then Y happens. And now you know, I have no doubt that we will have tons and tons and tons of research and papers coming out of COVID and, and, and pandemic and 
and, and pandemic preparedness and so on and so forth after this, but we might be sort of, again, blinding ourselves to the, the variety, the myriad of other risks that might come. The next uh, global catastrophic crisis is not necessarily going to be a pandemic. And, 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 and we might get the public and the policymakers pay more attention and be more prepared for the next pandemic, but would we be able to do uh, for the other risks is I think the big question. Um, I mean, I, I have no answer, of course. Uh, but I think that's that's one 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 major thing. Um, picking on that, this at least for the foreseeable future, uh, partly because of the shock the, the pandemic created, um, there's already increasing interest in, in in thinking about these global catastrophic industrial risks. Uh, what what your suggestions uh, for someone in a master's uh, program or in, in just in a finishing undergrad? Or, or, or going for a PhD, and who is interested and curious about these issues, um, to look at what kind of skills they need to sort of uh, develop, what kind of skills might be in, in, in demand uh, in, the, in the field, what are the promising avenues for research that is under-researched, and, and one might you know, focus on. What would your you know, suggestions be to, to some of the students in the class in that sense? So I think part Part of that might might be obvious <laughs> what, what I'll come to come to say from what I previously said, but um, so I think some of that is connecting up with another discipline. So I think this this will vary between different countries in in terms of how much uh, you kind of covered different disciplines in your kind of undergraduate and master's courses anyway. And uh, certainly, thinking of the UK context, you've generally covered one subject. Uh, at undergraduate, you've probably followed that off either directly or quite closely at the masters. Um, so, I mean, it's one of the things I kind of think to myself now, well, yeah, I would have liked to have maybe done a master's in a different area as well, just to bringing in a bit more of a connection to, to another field and knowing its language a bit more. Um, you can pick, pick that up later in your career. So I think that was useful. The time I spent in Manchester, I spent with a lot of people working in bioethics and medical law. Um, so I picked up, picked up some of what was going on there. Um, so you, you, you can, do it in that way. Um, I guess that's also thinking beyond the academic space as well. I think you kind of pointed this out earlier, maybe spend a couple of years in a policy environment or in a technology environment and, and find out what kind of practice and things go on there and know how you would build those sorts of connections. And if you then wanted to move back and kind of do some more of the study and, and working it directly in the kind of existential risk field, then you've got those that knowledge and understanding of, okay, if I want to change something, get out outside of this little bubble <laughs> is how I go about it. And I guess I'd like to see um, some people out there thinking about education systems in themselves and what we do with those. Um, because we, you mentioned misaligned incentives earlier and um, I think we've been really lucky with our centre and uh, the people who are funding it and the, yeah, that we've managed to, to do this work, to do this interdisciplinary work, to do this work that's not just about producing uh, journal articles in the academic sphere and being able to do other forms of outreach. But academia is not necessarily aligned well to that yet. No. It, there are generally very nice statements about interdisciplinarity, but actually getting that both through, through your sort of career training, um, but also getting that supported in terms of your promotions, the outputs you produce and how, what gets counted is, is really important. So yeah, I guess people looking at education systems and how they can uh, be better suited to managing um, future global challenges would be good. I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that everybody praises interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity, but it's always not in my backyard um, thing, you know, it's nice far away, not in my department, my university, there's an excellent um, uh, clip. I, you know, if you have watched it, you probably did. The whole, from 1980s, the um, uh, Yes Prime Minister um, series has an excellent uh, uh, sketch where a portion where uh, there's a bunch of, you know, old white men uh, uh, around around a table and talk about how diverse uh, the, uh, the 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 table is and and then they talk about why for the particular departments uh, in a, 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 a quota for 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 more women is not suitable in principle they are all in agreement and the need but for their particular department it is not suitable i think that's very much true for the interdisciplinarity debate too um, and I think we need to we need to work on that uh, very much. Um, well, Dr. Catherine Rollis, thank you so much um, for for coming uh, onto this and taking time. This has been great, and um, 
uh, and I'm, I'm sure the students will actually take a lot uh, from this. Uh, Dr. Catherine Rothers from the Center for the Aesthetic Accessories, uh, Cambridge. Thank you.